Well, good morning to each of you. It's great to be with you. I was uh, sitting in my office at Heritage, I think it was Tuesday morning, and the text came from Sean. I can't remember his exact words, but something to the effect, what are you doing Sunday morning? And then Wednesday morning, sitting in my office, minding my own business, and the text came from, uh, from Brian, what are you doing Friday morning? <laughs> and so here we are, and it is great to be with you. And I have no qualms about it, no hesitation. This is indeed a joy and awesome privilege to open God's Word among God's people. And so let's turn together in our Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we're just going to focus on a couple of simple verses. Many years ago, a, a little girl, perhaps three years of age, she climbed up into her mother's lap, fixed her big blue eyes upon her mother's face, and whispered softly, I love you, as big as Walmart, and everything in it. As you can imagine, uh, that mom, it melted her heart, absolutely melted her heart. Now, that little girl isn't so little anymore. She's now a young woman. And today, if she were to snuggle up close to her mom and whisper to her, I love you as big as Walmart and everything in it, her mom would be less than impressed. <laughs> she would have to come up with something much bigger uh, than Walmart. What we want to ponder for a few moments today is simply this, a marvelous declaration of love, a marvelous demonstration of love. And Paul points us in that direction in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, and listen carefully to what Paul proclaims here by the Spirit. But God shows His love for us. In that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. It is incomparable. It is incalculable. The Bible tells us that it is a love that surpasses knowledge. It is marvelous any way we look at it. And here the Apostle Paul expresses it so eloquently, does he not? That God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. And so here's the question we're going to consider. What makes it so marvelous? What makes this declaration, this demonstration of love so incomparable? Great to see the kids here this morning, the young ones. Great to hear them. You can understand this, kids. I want you to pay attention, close attention. This is simple. This is straightforward. You've just heard me declare it, God's marvelous love. All we want to do is to try to wrap our minds as best we can around what makes it so marvelous. And the answer is threefold. Paul basically tells us three things in these verses that make God's love, this declaration of love, this demonstration of love, so marvelous. Here is the first. God shows His love by saving sinners. That makes it marvelous. God shows His love by saving sinners. I'm not making it up. Again, turn with me to our text. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. God shows His love by saving sinners. 
We might not want to hear this. It's not a very pleasant thing to hear, but it is absolutely necessary to hear and to remind ourselves of constantly. There is nothing in us that causes God to love us. There is nothing in you, nothing in me, that compels God to love us. There is nothing meritorious. There is nothing virtuous. There is nothing delightful. There is nothing adorable. There is nothing lovable. Paul makes it clear. We are sinners. You might not have come here this morning expecting to hear that, but there it is. It's the starting point, isn't it? Because it is, in the first instance, what makes God's love so marvelous is that He saves sinners. It's like when you bought that engagement ring, fellas, way back, if you can remember back 10, 20, 30, 40 years, or perhaps recently, some earrings, something like it, something with diamonds, and you wander into that jewelry store, right? And uh, those diamonds, earrings, bracelet, engagement ring, whatever the case may be, there it is displayed, always against what? What's the backdrop? Always black. This black, dark backdrop. Why? To set off the brilliance of the diamonds. Oh, God displayed His love. God shows His love by saving sinners. I mean, what is sin? What is sin? I guess the starting point is simply this. I mean, sin is doing bad things, isn't it? Kids, you know all about it. Adults, come on, you know all about it too. Sin is simply doing bad things. Sin is disobeying God's commands. It's lying. It's cheating. It's stealing. It's envy. It's greed. It's gluttony. It's immorality. You can add to the list, but peel back the layers. Peel back the layers. What is sin? Well, in addition to doing bad things, sin is, uh, is turning good things into idols, isn't it? It's taking perfectly good things, success, money, relationships, sports, recreation, whatever the case may be, taking perfectly good things but making them ultimate things and ascribing to them more value than God Himself whereby these things actually become idols. They're actually what we're living for. They're actually what we're looking to find our happiness in. Oh, but pull back the layers. What is sin? Go even deeper. What is it? It's loving ourselves more than we love God. Aren't we getting closer to the heart of the matter now? The Bible says you're to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Right now, I dare you. Put your hand up if that's you. I dare you. I'll come after you. I really will. You are to love God. I am to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Here's my problem. I'm a selfaholic by nature. I love myself more than I love God. That is my basic operating system, love of self. I'm assuming there's a lawn bowling green somewhere here in Hespeler. Is there? Maybe. I've never seen one. Definitely down in Galt, I'm sure, but we all know what lawn bowling is, right? Some of you perhaps have even played it on a warm summer night, and there they are all dressed in white, and they have that white ball, the jack, and uh, someone throws it down to the other end of the lawn, and each team has the four bowls, and the idea is to get your bowl closest to the white jack, and the team that gets their ball, bowl closest wins that round. Here's the trick. Those bowls are leaded, aren't they? There's lead in one side of that bowl making the bowl biased. And so whichever side of the bowl the weight is on, when you throw it, that bowl is going to curve two, three, four feet, always. There's absolutely nothing you can do to stop it. The bowl is biased. Friend, you are biased, and I am biased. We have a very natural inclination, and that inclination is self-love. We are lovers of self more than we are lovers of God. The Minnesota Crime Commission came out decades ago. I don't think they go, get away with stating this today, but this was back in the 70s. The Minnesota Crime de Commission declared every baby starts life as a little savage. It was back in the 70s how things have changed. He is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it. His bottle, his mother's attention, 
his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch, and deny him these wants, and he seethes with rage and aggressiveness, which would be murderous if he were not so helpless. It is a deeply implanted principle of self-love. We're getting much closer now, are we not, to the heart, the essence of sin. You want me to go even deeper? Whether you want me to not, I'm going to go even deeper. You peel back another layer, and what do we discover? What is the essence of sin? Paul tells us back in chapter 1, verse 30, we are haters of God. We are by nature haters of God. Because we hate anything that challenges our self-autonomy. We resent anything that dares to usurp our self-love. And it is the original sin, my friend. Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And go all the way back to the devil's temptation, Adam and Eve. And what was the delectable fruit that he placed before them? In the day you eat thereof, you will be like God. I want to be God. My friend, we have now arrived at the very core of the essence of sin. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, that makes the love of God simply marvelous. That God, that God would send His Son to die on behalf of natural-born enemies and to not die on behalf of those who by nature and very essence are haters of God. To drive this home, friends, I know it's unpleasant, but again, it is the diamond against that black backdrop. We're trying to set forth the brilliance of the diamond, set forth the brilliance of the gospel, set forth the brilliance, just how marvelous God's love is. Walk with me through this. Think through it. Just how repugnant this sin is in the sight of God. Years ago, Allison and I, we were missionaries in Portugal at the time. And while there, I, I received an invitation to go preach in Ireland for a couple of weeks. And before we went off on that uh, tour of Ireland, um, I turned off the electricity in our little apartment in Portugal. It was uh, July, the hottest month of the year. I forgot to empty the fridge. It gets worse. <laughs> and the freezer. So when we returned home two weeks later and I put that key in that front door and opened that front door, I nearly fell to my knees. I have never smelt anything so revolting in my life. Allison, go in, deal, deal with that quickly, please. <laughs> that is our sin in the sight of God. Do we understand that? He who is too pure to behold evil, and yet his love is marvelous, he shows it by saving sinners. Did you get that? Kids, are you tracking with me? Here comes number two. God shows His love by saving sinners from His wrath. Again, return with me to our text. Verse 8, but God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore, we have now been justified by His blood. Much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. You go all the way back to chapter 1, verse 18. And there Paul, he, 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 he points us to God's present wrath. And he tells us that right now, Right now, if we care to just take a look around at the world in which we live, we will discover, we will see beyond dispute that God's wrath is revealed right now against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. And then you skip into chapter 2, verse 5, it gets even worse because not only do we have the present revelation of the wrath of God, but there in chapter 2, verse 5, Paul tells us that we're actually storing up for ourselves. Storing up for ourselves. Wrath. When? On the day of wrath. 
when the righteous judgment of God shall be revealed. And so you have the present revelation of the wrath of God. You have the future revelation of the wrath of God. Friend, you know what that makes you and me by nature? We're dead men walking. You know that expression, right? You maybe used it in the playground years ago. Oh, you're a dead man walking right? Trying to talk all tough. And we hear it. You're a dead man walking. What does it mean? It is as if you're dead. It is a sure thing. It is a certain thing. That is our condition. As we're born into this world, born under the present wrath of God, it's called death. We're all going to die. And born under what? Because we are children of wrath, that sentence of death, wrath, condemnation, eternal condemnation, separation from God. And yet God shows His love, just how marvelous His love is, by saving sinners from His wrath. I'm going to confess this to you. It doesn't move me as I wish it did. Why is that? It doesn't overwhelm me like it should. You know, Niagara Falls, what is it? An hour and a half down the road? No traffic, hour and a half down the road, Niagara Falls. I don't know what it's been like during the COVID years, probably pretty lean, but pre-COVID, I think it was 12, 13, 14 million tourists go to see the falls every year. Here we are just an hour and a half away, and what do we think to ourselves? What's the big deal? It's in our backyard. Been there, done that, all right? When friends come to visit from out of town, out of country, we might make the obligatory visit and say, yeah, this is pretty neat. But what happens? Familiarity and proximity breed what? Contempt. Indifference. So what? What's the big deal? Oh, is it possible we have heard of the severity of our sins so often that it no longer breaks our hearts? Is it possible we have become so familiar with Christ's atonement that it no longer warms our hearts? Is it possible that we've heard of God's mercy so many times that it no longer melts our hearts? And dare I ask it, is it possible we have heard of God's wrath so much, so familiar with it, that it no longer overwhelms? our hearts. When we lose sight of the severity of sin and the corresponding severity of the wrath of God, do you know what happens? The gospel passes from good news to simply news. It passes from good news to simply news. And you know what else happens? God's love passes from marvelous to ordinary simply ordinary. Oh, but listen closely to this. It is the darkness of night that makes the dawn so uplifting, isn't it? You know it's true. The darkness of night that makes the dawn so uplifting. It is the torment of pain that makes relief so comforting. It is the cold of winter that makes spring so encouraging. It is the loneliness of separation that makes reunion so refreshing. And it is the prospect of hell that makes God's love so awe-inspiring. God shows His love by saving sinners from His wrath. And now here comes the third. Are you ready? Here it is. Why God's love is so marvelous. He shows His love by saving sinners from His wrath through Christ's death. Again, to our text, verse 8, but God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. God's wrath, there it is, suspended, hanging over our heads. The Lord Jesus Christ, here He is, ascending the cross. 
There he is encompassed in that darkness, that internal torment of soul, and that visible, tangible reminder as those three hours of darkness cloud all that is transpiring there upon the cross. And the Lord Jesus Christ, as he is suspended between heaven and earth, he swallows hell whole. The wrath of God comes to the cross at that moment. And there the Lord Jesus Christ becomes a curse for us. And we know He has become a curse for us because we hear it from His lips. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What is going on there? He is being forsaken so that we can be welcomed. He is being punished so that we can be forgiven. He is being condemned so that we can be justified. And now this God who shows His love in the giving of His Son, He is prepared to treat us as if we were Christ. We can stand before God as if we were Christ because Christ has stood before God as if He were us. Did you hear that? We can stand before God as if we are the Lord Jesus Christ, He having paid the penalty for our sin in full upon Calvary's cross, we becoming one with Him through faith, we can now stand before God as if we were Christ. Because Christ has done what? He has stood before God as if He were us. He has become sin for us. He has become a curse for us. And he has borne God's wrath in full for us, swallowing it whole, leaving nothing but the love for us. Oh, says Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Jesus Christ was up on the cross, bleeding, dying, looking down on the people betraying him and forsaking him and denying him. And in the greatest act of love in the history of the universe, he stayed. He held on to us. He died for us. And that, my friend, is how you know that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Is that marvelous to you, my friends? Any unbelievers here this morning, don't raise your hands. I'm assuming there are. I am so glad you're here. Thrilled you are here, and you are most welcome to be here. I pray this overwhelms your, your, your soul, friend. I pray it uh, grips you, humbles you, compels you to consider the Lord Jesus Christ, who He is and what He has done. And the Bible tells you, my friend, very simple in no uncertain terms. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. We sing, a, we sing a hymn, friend, and I recommend it to you as a very simple prayer. If you're not a Christian, it is this. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. That is faith. That is turning away from ourselves, our self-love, the entire life we've lived, and any vestige of righteousness we think we might have. It is turning away from it all, forsaking it all, and simply declaring to God, nothing, nothing. I bring nothing. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross of Christ I cling. And where there is brokenness, God promises healing. And where there is conviction, God promises mercy. And where there is weariness, God promises rest. And where there is repentance, God promises forgiveness. And brothers and sisters, are you overwhelmed and encouraged by the marvelous love of God this day? That He loves us lavishly. At times I fear we don't fully appreciate it Many of us perhaps think back to that uh, schoolyard or street experience when it came to uh, choosing teams to play street hockey. 
or to play British Bulldog or whatever the case may be, you hearken back and you went through that terrible process of choosing teams and the biggest, the strongest, the quickest went first and by the end, they weren't choosing anymore. They're simply telling kids to go join a team. It makes no difference. <laughs> Begrudgingly. I fear at times that's how we perceive God's love for us. He loves us begrudgingly. Oh, no, my friend. He loves us lavishly. And He has declared it in no uncertain terms. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. God shows His love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by His blood much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. Our Heavenly Father, by Your Spirit, may You impress Your Word deep within our hearts this day. And may our hearts be filled with faith, hope, and love. And may You enlarge our esteem for the Lord Jesus Christ, His person and His work. We pray that he might have all the preeminence in our hearts and in our lives. And as we consider what transpired upon Calvary's cross, yes, may we again be humbled for our sin. Yes, may we stand in fear as we consider your very wrath. But eclipsing these, may our hearts be so encouraged and comforted by that great love which you have toward us in Christ Jesus. So receive our thanks, receive our worship as we offer it in His most precious name. Amen.